So thank you guys for tuning in again to another episode of Community Voices. My name is Omar, Senior Coaching Partnership Strategist for Finish Line. We have a very special guest today, you know, Detroit legend, NBA vet, owner of the greatest hairline in the business, Jalen, <laughs> Jalen Rose. Jalen, what's up? How you feeling? What up, though? Thanks a lot for having me on. Appreciate the love. Yeah, of course. Anytime. So if we get right into it, you know, you talk about you being an NBA player and now you transition into being an ESPN analyst. How has that transition been for you? Especially, I'm sure you do your routine when you was in the NBA and now it's like that nine to five grind kind of. Absolutely. So each um, transition um, ha has its own way of uh, manifesting itself. And for me, I played in the 2000 finals uh, with the Indiana Pacers as the Lakers and the late great Kobe Bryant and Shaq won their first or their three-peat. And their third championship when they were playing against the Nets, I was covering it for BET Mad Sports. Right. So I got traded to the Bulls between 2000 and 2002. And I was like, oh, they ain't making the playoffs. We ain't going to be there. They got nine wins. <laughs> so in February. So my major in college was communications, radio, TV, film. Yeah. I'm doing what I always wanted to do. And so that's when I started working in the media while I was playing. I was still in the league. Mm -hmm. BT Mass Sports, Best Damn Sports Show, Top Rank Boxing, NFL Network, Cold Pizza before it was first take. Um, I was doing TNT sidelines. You could Google when Nick Van Exel threw the tile on me, I kept <laughs> it moving. Um, and so all of those experiences led when I retired in 2007 to mm -hmm. work full time for ESPN. And that's where I initially started doing uh, NBA Tonight and a lot of sports center hits. Cool. So now that I feel like, you know, that gives you even like an even bigger platform, especially you being on national TV during all these games. So, you know, leveraging your your reach and your awareness to bring, you know, especially within the black and brown community, those different issues. So how important is it to you to elevate those issues on the platform you're, you're on? It's mandatory because for for black people, while we were initially brought to the United States in chains and our relationship with this country was um, free labor slash slavery and to entertain. Well, what ended up happening is those areas became things that now all of a sudden for mass consumption, people pay top dollar for. You could get paid a lot of money to actually play sports and entertain. Now, as the founder of a school, I would love for us to invest the kind of money in teachers and people continue to invest the kind of um, resources that we do in education, like we do in entertainment, but right. our society wants to be entertained. So now as a, a black athlete, you have to understand that while, yes, I'm going to play the game I love, I want to, you know, be in the NBA, I want to take care of my family and all of this, but I'm a man first. And before we get out there and entertain, and you saw this with the Milwaukee Bucks, yeah. it's important for us to talk about our human rights because we're hurting right now. Mm -hmm. And the day that the Breonna Taylor official ruling came down after 194 days that the two officers weren't charged, and basically the guy was charged is the person that shot into the wall mm -hmm. of her white neighbor. Um, it's crazy that, that day he got charged for like the bullets he missed. Right. So, so that day, I, I cannot lie to you. I literally had on a, a double breasted suit and mm -hmm. I was just sweating. I was just sweating. And it was cool in the studio. I was just sweating. And I, I realized how much I idolize NBA players because they're in a the bubble making all of these sacrifices. And then the Milwaukee Bucks will say, you know what, instead of playing a basketball game, we think it's important to call our local officials to try to get some local laws changed because we continue to see people that look like us, our brothers and sisters that are unarmed to be harmed and or um, killed right. by vigilantes or white supremacists and or the police. They did that. Athletes did that. And they stand on the shoulders of the giants that I sit in front of this picture. These guys weren't just athletes. That's Jim Brown. That's Muhammad Ali. It's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. That's Bill Russell. Like what? Correct. So, you know, Tommy Smith and John Carlos at the Olympics, Craig Hodges, when he went to the White House, I played with Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf in Denver. 
when he prayed during the national anthem. I was in the media um, when Colin Kaepernick decided to take a piece for protest and a knee. What we had to understand is since you guys are going to pay attention to us entertaining, we're going to now use that platform to get you to listen to us. Mm -hmm. And that over the last four years has changed a lot for mainstream America. I think um, there's always flashing points. You know, somebody that was a child of the 70s, I remember just hearing the horror stories about what happened to Emmett Till. Right. And or Fred Hampton. So I was a young person, of the, a child of the 70s, where, you know, black people basically were charged to be scared of white people or to be treated as less than, and in a lot of cases, be forced to accept it. Mm -hmm. That's why the late great John Lewis talked about being in good trouble. And so the notable people from your community, now when they get successful, it's paramount that they use their voice to reach back or give back. Otherwise, everybody gets a chance to ignore us. We don't look at the Fortune 500 companies. Yeah. We don't own them. What do we own? Three. We don't, we don't own any of the teams. Michael Jordan, one owner. Um, what is one uh, black president in the um, NBA? Mm -hmm. um, Masai Ujiri, who happened to just win the championship last year. Right. And it's been one black president in our country of all time, Barack right. Obama. So what I try to stress, and this is a sports analogy, but I don't want to discourage the players. So I'm talking to the team. I say, hey, it's the first quarter. Look up at that scoreboard. It's 400 plus years to zero. 400 years of slavery to zero. We're going to play this game and not quit. But we got to go for field position. So it's going to be times where it's three and out. It's going to be times we get one or two first downs. Mm -hmm. Then they're going to punt us back to the goal line. That's what it's been. And so the notable people, the celebrities, the public figures, the ones that are able to make it out, the ones that are able to make some money, the ones that are able to have their voice and lend their time energy to give back to others that look like them, that's mandatory. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's a non-negotiable in my opinion. Absolutely. And then you mentioned like the local politicians with the bucks, so especially – we go into election year with November 4th and speak on the importance of voting. And especially because some people, when, when you think of voting, they think it was just the president, but the local politicians are just as important too. So speak on that folks. Absolutely. So, and then, and by the way, I, I never um, understood how we romanticized Bill Clinton's presidency. Mm -hmm. And I was somebody that was in front of the curve long time ago, never liking us joking that he was the first black president when mm -hmm. I knew about mass incarceration. And I know that there's a prison called Clinton Correctional Facility. Wow. Okay, that 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 now exists. And so from us getting incarcerated at one rate in the 70s and 80s, until when that started to happen, that 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 had a, 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 a dramatic negative influence on our community. Yeah. And so those judges, they can be voted for. Our current president has sat 300 judges, 300 across the country, not three, not 30, 300. Okay. So that means they're carrying the ideology that he has. There's a reason why right now they're trying to fill the Supreme Court spot, Ruth Bader, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because... And I almost called this like literally and disrespectfully over someone dead body because she's barely even in the ground. Right. Just think about this. And, and you know, the social warrior that she was about justice. And so they're trying to fill that spot for one distinct reason. So they can have the majority of the Supreme court. And when they do that, what they're going to try to do, they're going to try to take away your Medicaid. They're going to try to take away Obamacare. They're going to try to not cover, make sure people get covered with pre-existing conditions. They're going to try to make sure immigrants get deported. Like all of these things are happening real time. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> we now get a chance to vote, as you mentioned, for president, but there's senators, there's governors, there's mayors, there's judges. That, that It's really important for us to be informed because these are the people that are making these level of decisions. You could be on the Supreme Court. You know how long you could be on the Supreme Court? 
I don't know, but I know it's a, a extremely long time, longer than it should be, actually. Correct, forever. Yeah, like <laughs> just think about that forever. Yeah. So that person that he's going to put on for that reason can basically have that job forever. Which is crazy to think because you think how presidents only could do two terms or eight years, but you could put somebody in place who could stay there for like the rest of their life and really make drastic decisions and changes to just everyday people. Which is why it's so important to like vote, especially for the judges, local politicians and straight up and down. Right now, by the way, y'all don't have to wait till the third at 8 p.m. Eastern. That's yeah. game. You can vote right now. Yeah. You can vote right now. Just www.vote.gov. You can vote right now. You can, you don't, don't wait. Mm -hmm. you, 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 in Texas, taking mailboxes up off the ground so people can't cast their ballots. Like this is really happening. Yeah. So that lets you know how important it is. If it didn't matter, they wouldn't be doing that, creating those barriers. They would be saying, yes, come on, come on. We mm. want everybody to vote. We want a <laughs> democracy, right? That You're hearing the opposite. Right. And you think about like, when you go to the more affluent neighborhoods, the voting process is so much smoother than when you go to like, you know, the communities you and I are from, where you're waiting on lines for like hours just to place a vote. And all those things and, are like on purpose. And just the polling places. Now, now let's go back to the power of, of, of athletics. And it ain't all sports. It's the sports that are dominated by black players. Yeah. Bubba Wallace, he did a great job of, you know, getting them to take down those Confederate flags, but he got a Harriet Tubman long way to go mm -hmm. to change what's going to happen in NASCAR. But yeah. when you're talking about the NBA, the WNBA sports that's 75, 80% black, it's like, okay, we got a game, but we need to – just make sure our civil rights are being responded and respected. And it'd be great if you could put Black Lives Matter on the floor. It'd be great if we could put some messages on the back of our jerseys. Absolutely. And so, and so th that, that level of awareness is something that has to continue to carry throughout this voting process as well. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, we now see that the president and his wife have tested positive for coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Can anybody say they're surprised? This ain't no shots of no shade. Like, this is real. Like, over 200,000 people have died. Yeah. We're not back to normal as long as you're required to wear a mask. As long as I'm <laughs> required to wear a mask, it ain't normal. At all. It is not normal. So we got to stay safe, stay distant, continue to wash your hands, especially in the Black community, because we don't even, as you was talking about, um, like being a... a in the inner city, like just the proximity and pre-existing conditions and stuff like that, that's where it affects us a lot more as well. Cool. My bad. There's a whole truck outside my window right now. Oh, ain't no truck. Crazy. Ain't no truck. <laughs> um, <clears throat> should be good. Yeah, so that's a great uh, segue into talking about the Jalen Rose Leadership Academy. So talk to me about like your, your passion for education and how the Jalen Rose Leadership Academy came to be. My personal passion about education, why I love sports, I always took pride in education and I never want to be, wanted to be considered a dumb job. Right. So while I was an All-American in high school, I was an honor roll student as well. While I was a member of the Fab Five in college, I was a member of the Dean's List as well. Mm -hmm. I left school after my junior year, I went back and got my degree. I graduated from college as well. So that's always been important to me. Um, because I wanted to put myself in position to where I felt like, what are the barriers that they're setting up for people to look like me? Yeah. Okay. I want to accomplish all of the things that when they put a bio of a 55 year old white guy, I want to accomplish some of those things like, Oh, best selling author. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. I understand. That's how the high school graduate, college graduate. Okay. Got it. And so as I started to, um, be exposed to corporate America, I started to realize the influence that I could have was via education to give back to my community right. and make a substantial impact. So I started the Jalen Rose Charitable Fund initially, and we were giving five, we were aiding five students per year. We did it for seven or eight years. And I also started, started the Jalen Rose um, Scholarship Endowment at the University of Michigan. This was early 2000s. And so really, JRLA being founded in 2011, 
with just a graduation of my mission to try to do what I can to influence as many young people in my community as possible. Mm -hmm. So currently we father a nine through 16 model. I have 400 plus students that are between ninth and 12th grade, another 500 that are between freshman year and fifth year of college. And we support them all the way through because it was really important to me to influence young people between the ages of 14 and 22, because in America, we're not viewed as cute and cuddly when we get that age anymore. We get dismissed. And um, when we start to have opinions, when we start to get exposed to life, when we start to get exposed to poverty, that's when we get less support. So I was trying to create a school in my community that could be a beacon of hope, but also bridge the education gap and allow those students to get the same quality of education as their suburban counterparts or those that go to private schools. Yeah, because I find it so fascinating where your the quality of education you get is just dictated based on your zip code, which I feel like is extremely unfair because you want everybody to have the same kind of access to education. And you know, it's not really the children's fault like on how they're born or the kind of situations they're born into. So well, here's the thing. Right? You want and I want, mm -hmm. but that's why it's called systemic racism. That's how it's set up. Mm -hmm. That that's how it's set up. It's it's oh the suburbs pay more in taxes, so therefore we'll give them better schools, better police responders, better fire departments, better public service, better trash. We'll give them better everything forever, and we'll continue to give the zip code from the urban community a lot less, and it fosters itself throughout education as well. That's why we call it bridging the education gap. Amazing. So, you know, us at Finish Line and JD Sports, we love what you're doing. Um, big fan of yours as well, especially when you speak on these kind of issues. So we definitely want to make a nice donation for your time and the show love. It's probably my favorite part of these interviews when I bring out the big check. Uh oh. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. I didn't know that was happening. Yeah, That's so love. We got 20,000. Yo. Leadership Academy. Yo, they told me you guys were going to do a small donation for me taking the time, and I was getting excited about the conversation. I was going to hit y'all up about some 15 Puma kicks. Uh, we can send the Pumas. We can send whatever, but we want to make sure. Oh, that's love, bro. I appreciate that. And let me tell you why that's so very important. Yeah. We're open enrollment. <clears throat> we're tuition free. Yeah. We're public charter. We don't test students in based on their scores into ninth grade and then test them out after ninth grade. Right. We also have special needs students and we get zero state funding for our facility. Zero state funding for our facility. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate the donation. It really means a lot. Thanks for the love. Yeah, of course. And you know, we see the work you're doing to impact the lives of like all these kids in Detroit. So hopefully that 20,000 you know, it goes a long way to, you know, speak to the mission you're trying to do with the school. So appreciate that. It definitely you is. It definitely will. Now, so thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the love. Yeah. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to all the ladies on your team, too, for making this happen as well. Between, between Candy, Deb, uh, who else? The whole Rocky. Stuart, team. Michelle. Michelle. Yeah. Absolutely. That. And see, like, people see me in front of the camera, but, you know, it's like when you see a dove just kind of going smooth on the ocean. But what you don't see underneath is all of the legs that are churning. That's what I'm fortunate enough to have, an amazing right. team. So appreciate that shout. Yeah, of course. And, uh, yeah, that wraps up this episode. I'm pretty sure you got a crazy schedule ahead of you with the game tonight. Um, and yeah, appreciate you taking time out, Jay. I appreciate the love and don't hesitate to reach out. And definitely, um, if you guys ever make it to the city, I'd love to show you guys around the school and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely, definitely.